welcome to this, the final session of our Vision and Commitment course. I want to start by saying that this is very much a part two of the previous session, which was Biblical Manhood and Womanhood One. Uh, if you're watching or listening to this without having gone through part one, I would just encourage you to stop right now and go back and listen to the previous session because so much of what we're gonna talk about is a practical outworking of the biblical instruction that we previously taught on. The other thing I want to say about this session is that it is more technical than any of our normal sessions. It's an exegesis of a passage of scripture. And because of that, it's systematic and thorough. There are less kind of anecdotes and funny stories connected to this but there is just as much of a need for revelation. And that's what we're looking to God for as we get into this subject. So let's turn to the notes. It says in Ephesians chapter three, verses 10 to 11, his intent was that now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms, according to his eternal purpose, which he accomplished in Christ Jesus, our Lord. In the previous session, we considered the wisdom and purpose of God in creating us male and female. We saw how sin affected the complementary and harmonious relationship men and women were designed to have. Through the redemptive work of Christ, however, we once again have the power and privilege of manifesting God's original intention. While looking at several New Testament passages giving gender-specific instruction on roles and functions, we briefly considered 1 Corinthians 11 verses 2 to 16, which shed light on the subject of women speaking out in church gatherings. This passage comes in a section of Paul's letter where he is addressing various issues pertaining to the meeting together of the saints. He later brings instruction on the covenant meal and the gifts of the spirit, but here his focus is the practice of men removing any type of head covering when praying out or prophesying and it's parallel instruction that women should wear a head covering when doing so. This is what we will look at in this, our final session. So just a small point I want to make uh, from the outset here is that it's important that we recognize that Paul's instruction is not first to women putting on some type of head covering, but that men should remove any type of head covering that they're wearing. Because very often, whenever this subject is addressed, it's immediately focused in on women wearing head covering, rather than realizing that actually that's a parallel instruction. And this applies to men as much as it does to women. So doctrine and practice. 2 Timothy 3.16 says this, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Some might wonder why we would devote an entire session to this relatively obscure subject. The very fact that most Christians seem to know so little about this passage is perhaps reason enough to look into it. More than that, though, we are committed to facing and responding obediently to all of God's word. And we have a particular responsibility where scripture commands practice, i.e. an established form of practical outworking based on doctrine, i.e. the full biblical instruction on any given subject presented for the purpose of application in life. Some things we do are not rooted in doctrine, but are simply practical, such as screening the microphone at public meetings. Such practices should not, of course, be contrary to sound doctrine and may indeed serve scripturally directed goals, e.g. in this particular case, that meetings are conducted in an orderly manner by providing guidance to those bringing public contributions. Nevertheless, they are not of an enduring nature and are subject to change. Okay, so what are we saying here? 
I'm wanting you to understand, I'm trying to distinguish between practices in church life which are merely helpful for us to be able to function in communion together. Things that don't actually carry any biblical basis as such. There's not chapter and verse that we can look at to support what we're doing versus those things that are actually practices that are instituted in scripture with real foundation of understanding. Things like the communion meal that we spoke about in a previous session, or maybe baptism, for example, which is something that is a practice built on a very solid biblical foundation. Now, you know, there will be things that are, like I say, completely subject to change, you know, and so we use that reference of screening the microphone. Now, what are we doing when we do that? Well, we're just trying to help the meeting move in a more fluid direction. We're, we're bringing guidance and direction at that point, but it could be a practice such as this would change over time. Okay, um, sometimes we will find in church life practices that had a reason once upon a time uh, but as time has gone on, that reason has long since died away. Uh, often in traditional churches, you'll find certain things that are going on and you find nothing in the New Testament that refers to them, but they're practices of the church. One particular one, I, I, very vivid to me, was uh, um, uh, the use of incense within the particular uh, church that I grew up in. And I was an altar boy, and one of my job was called a thurible bearer. And that was basically, I used to have this brass globe, and in it there would be incense that you would light, and you would walk in front of the priest swinging this, this globe, and it would give this fragrant smell, you know. And um, I always assumed that this was somehow connected to the use of incense in the Old Testament, and um, but in actual fact, if you look in church history, it wasn't there at the early church. It, in fact, it wasn't there through much of the first four, five hundred years or more of the church. But during the period of the Middle Ages, uh, where the church had become very prosperous in many ways, and um, uh, but the church was always available to the common man and woman. And so the church would be filled with peasants and the smell of in the church would be horrendous, so much so that the priests couldn't endure the whole service or mass as they would call it uh, without kind of like losing his breakfast, you know. And so what would happen is uh, an altar boy would walk in front of him swinging this incense to cover the reek of the church, you know. And um, I always found this funny or I found this funny later on in life when I began studying these things because there's a certain point in the mass where this altar boy would go uh, to the altar and do this kind of blessing on the congregation, you know, and really it was like, you stink, you stink, you stink. And yeah, I used to love to do that bit. So, um, so yeah, so that's typical of something that at one point had a purpose, but as time went on, became part of the overall feel of the service, but actually had lost its original meaning in every way. Now, listen, as we get into what we're going to talk about, one of the things that I want to say is that revelation is always our goal. So in teaching this, our purpose, our goal is not that people would just adopt a practice for the sake of it or just because it's been taught, but that God would literally reveal to them the significance of the wonder of that which is biblical. And, um, and that's why we're praying and seeking God that he, even as I unpack uh, this passage of scripture that we're going to look at, that God would somehow shine light through that and that you would see something of great significance. Now, I know that people will always see things to varying degrees. And I recognize the fact of a principle that we've said before, which is it's often the narrow door of obedience that leads to the broad place of revelation. And I know for some people this will be, well, I'm not sure about it, but I'm going to walk through that narrow door of obedience. But again, the goal is revelation. The goal is that that narrow door would broaden out into a wonderful understanding of God's intention in this practice. So practice based on doctrine is of a wholly different nature. The subject matter of 1 Corinthians 11, 2 to 16 falls within this category. 
Our goal when establishing this type of practice in the church is revelation, both individually and corporately. And this comes as we study the word. Obviously, Paul knew that all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable. Why do we say obviously Paul knew this? Well, he wrote it apart from anything else. But he also knew that not all issues had the same weight or priority. 1 Corinthians 15 verses 3 to 4 say this. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Notice I emphasize the term as of first importance in that text that I just read. I believe that Paul was delivering many vital truths to the church in all of his writings. But even Paul is distinguishing something here. He's saying, yes, but there are some things that are of first importance. And then he goes on to actually specify what those first importance things are, that Christ died, that Christ was resurrected. He's actually bringing the essence of the gospel through what he's saying. Similarly, while emphasizing the importance of understanding and outworking the doctrinal practice in 1 Corinthians 11 to 16, we wish to make it clear that we do not consider it to have the same measure of priority and importance as many of the other subjects covered in this course. That said, let us look at some of the reasons that this subject has been treated as if it had no importance. Okay, so what am I saying here, guys? What I'm saying is when we look at a comparison between this teaching on head covering and uncovering, when we compare that with the teachings that we've brought on the gospel and being born again and water baptism, baptism in the Holy Spirit, the structure of the church, we're saying that we recognize that this does not carry the same weight of priority. But our concern in all of this is that uh, the Western church in particular has found a liberty to actually completely ignore this passage of scripture and the truth that it emphasizes. And I believe that as we unpack this, you're going to see why mm -hmm. the Western church has been so ready to reject these things, okay? And so, again, I'm wanting to point this out because as a church that does practice um, head covering and uncovering in the way that we're going to describe, it has caused us to very much stand out within the cultures that our churches are based. And one of the most frustrating things for us is that we can be known as the head covering churches, you know, as if that is the central thing that we're all about, you know. It kind of reminds me of the Quakers, you know, they were called Quakers because they used to tremble at the reading of the word. It's actually quite biblical. But I think to myself, of all the things that they were passionate about, of all the things that they were given to, it was a little practice that happened that caused them to be known as Quakers. Now, I look at it and think, God forbid that we should be known as head coverers, you know, because it's just a practice. It's part of a whole breadth of things that we're committed to outworking in obedience to the scriptures, you know. But in our cultures, in many of the cultures where our churches are, it is the most visible dynamic uh, that causes us at times to stand out from other churches similar to us. So kingdom culture and various reactions. It is important to point out that although unusual today, the Apostle Paul's teaching on this practice was accepted by the early church. The earliest evidence of this is the painted walls of the catacombs where the persecuted first century church would meet. Here women are depicted as distinct from men in that their heads are covered in worship. The practice continued in some form or other for virtually the entire 2,000 years of church history. That is right up until the 1960s. Okay, you understanding what we're saying here, guys? That the, the earliest uh, 
images that we had of the early church were written on those underground caves that the early church used to meet in and pictures, paintings were done on the walls. And what we're saying is even in those paintings, women are uh, distinct from men in their wearing head covering during scenes of worship. So even at the beginning it was there. But I don't want you to think that we've somehow plucked something out of the first century that has been abandoned for the 2,000 years of church history. Absolutely not. The opposite is true. This is a practice that has been common throughout the whole history of the church up until relatively recently. So up until the 60s, possibly 70s, there was no issue uh, regarding this particular practice. However, in recent times, the subject has evoked various negative responses, ranging from quick dismissal to passionate objection. Following are some of the main reasons for this. One, general ignorance. The first problem is not so much that 1 Corinthians 11, 2 to 16 has been taught badly, but rather that it has hardly been taught at all. This passage is not usually addressed in the teaching of local churches, and any awareness of it tends to be more a product of believers stumbling over it in their personal readings. You know, so maybe somebody's going through the Bible in a year, and suddenly they come to this passage and they think, I've never heard this before. I've never read this. What's this? You know, um, we had a practice in our church of systematically taking certain schools, certain programs through the New Testament. And there was this inevitable coming to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. What do we say about this? How do you respond to the fact that virtually no church in the modern Western world practices this? And so, again, I just want to say that oftentimes I will ask people when I am teaching on this, how many of you in your history of church life can remember a teaching on this subject? And honestly, unless those people happen to have come from our background, virtually none of them respond positively. Many of them have said, yeah, I, I, I seem to remember reading it once upon a time and I asked somebody and they just said, hey, it's a cultural thing or something like that. And we moved on. So again, the issue is not that this has been taught poorly. The issue is that it's just simply not been taught at all. Mm -hmm. I think I said um, last week when I was teaching that, you know, for as often as it is taught or even read, it may as well be literally ripped out of your Bibles. I remember one time somebody teaching on this and they, they read it and after they finished reading it, they just ripped the page out of their Bibles, crumpled it up and threw it away. And people were in shock and awe, like, oh, you know, he, he ripped out of his Bible. But the point was very powerfully made that, hey, you know, well, nobody practices this. Nobody observes this. Might as well not be in your Bible. And I think that that's true today. I think for many churches, for many Christians, it's just something that's so not addressed. All right, the second problem is that due to the recent lack of sound teaching, the church has been robbed of its ability to refute curious but frequently made explanations such as the passages referring to Corinthian prostitutes or the instruction was simply a cultural thing. Subsequently, these suggestions are accepted by millions of believers, resulting in a dismissal of actual obedience to the apostolic command. Okay, so what we're saying here, guys, is because there hasn't been any solid teaching on the subject, it just means that people have swallowed whatever they've been told. You know, if you're not actually properly taught things, you'll swallow anything. That's just a reality. And particularly... And here's a major point I want you to understand, particularly if your inclination is already set against the issue. You know, if you're looking for a reason to dismiss something, people don't have to give you a lot of reasons. It's like, phew, thankfully, let's move on. We don't want to look at this. We don't like what it implies. We don't want to face it. I remember when um, the man who discipled me in the Lord first began teaching me these things. I was like, that's not going to work. You know, we're in the 80s, you know. You know, it's, it, it was like absolutely baffling to me that he would even be raising these issues. And it was only 
over time, as the revelation of God began to break on me, that I realized that I was dealing with eternal truth. It's nothing to do with the 80s. There's nothing to do with modern culture. It's nothing to do with the culture of the time, as I'll show you as we unpack this. This is to do with eternal truth. Secondly, cultural irrelevance. Those from certain traditional church backgrounds may be somewhat familiar with the concept of head coverings in connection with respect. Some may recall their mothers or perhaps grandmothers wearing hats to church. And most of us are familiar with the image of men removing hats as a sign of respect when praying or singing a national anthem. However, despite these practices having a root in a truth once understood, they are now rejected as meaningless, like so many practices that have continued by way of tradition without revelation. Okay, so again... Many of you have been to sports events. There's a standing up, there's a singing of the national anthem. And very often, if a young guy's got his hat on still, some old boy might give him a clip around the ear, take your hat off. You know, you ask them why, they have no idea why, but it's because actually a biblical truth, once understood and established for centuries upon centuries, is still actually ingrained in the culture. They just don't actually know why. And, you know, it's interesting with culture in general because, uh, uh, you know, cultural things can shift quite quickly, you know, from one generation to another. Remember a while ago just watching a movie and just watching the men walk down the streets and all the guys had hats on, you know, and then suddenly there was a cultural shift. I believe it was Kennedy, President Kennedy, who was the guy who first began to be a very public figure not wearing a hat. And that just took off, and then culturally, nobody was wearing hats anymore. And nowadays, if a guy wore a trilby or a hat, you'd think, what a poser, you know? And so, so like, culture is so shifted on those things. And I want to say again, one of the things that we've got to be careful of is sometimes we can be so committed to our culture that we will walk away from biblical truth for fear of what might appear to be weird. You know, sometimes I talk to people who have actually said to me, one of, one of the reasons I would struggle with, you know, wearing head covering would be, um, I just don't want to look weird to the unbeliever. I don't want an unbeliever to come among us and think, wow, that's weird. You know, she prays and prophesies with, with a baseball cap on. I, you know, I, I think that there is something very illogical in this discussion. Um, I just want to say, if somebody is coming into one of our churches which is committed to New Testament vitality and life. They're coming into an environment where people are raising their hands and shouting and jumping and, uh, you know, dancing. And, uh, you know, when somebody actually gets up to prophesy, that person is speaking as the very mouthpiece of God. Now, I've just got to say, maybe I'm wrong on this, but I've got to say, as an unbeliever coming into that environment, Somebody standing up and talking as though they're God among a bunch of people who are leaping around like demented rabbits. I don't think my big concern is going to be she's wearing a baseball cap when she does it. <laughs> I think it's the least of our concerns of weirdness. Can I just put it that way? Okay, so don't let strange uh, conclusions of a cultural nature rob you from obedience to what the scripture teaches. The third thing we're going to look at is various abuses. Regrettably, some churches that have practiced head covering have done so as part of a regime of male domination, the devaluing of women and legalistic control. This has resulted in individuals being fearful of anything they associate with those negative experiences. Guys, I just want to say something serious here. It is tragic to me that um, oftentimes the groups or the streams of churches uh, that have had a conviction over these issues have also had um, the most unbiblical views of manhood and womanhood, the exact contrary of the things that we taught in the previous session, which is 
uh, focused on the, the value and the wonder of God having made us different, but to serve harmoniously with one another. And it's become part and parcel of this whole concept of male domination and the devaluing of women. And oftentimes I've had to uh, have discussions and uh, help uh, ladies who have come from a history of that uh, realize that this is nothing to do with that misinterpretation of the scripture. And, um, and one of the things I often say to people um, is, listen, before you judge um, the outworking of this in the church, please come and visit us. Please come and experience our churches because I believe you'd be hard pressed to find a group where women are more passionate, vibrant, free and expressive than in our churches. And I say, listen, you don't have to have fallen into some weird kind of Amish way to practice this. In fact, it can be part of a liberating empowering outworking of truth and and I do believe uh, that that is what people experience among us which is so encouraging and um, you know there's that phrase about not throwing the baby out with the bathwater now I know that there's a lot of bathwater here I know there's a lot of bathwater around this subject but there's a very significant baby in there too and we mustn't throw out that baby Okay, so genuine interpretational differences. We recognize that there are many who share our passion for adherence to the word of God, but have earnestly arrived at different conclusions regarding how faithfulness to Paul's original intention might be practiced in the modern church. In our passion to see this passage taught and the practice restored, we are keen to maintain a non-judgmental attitude to those of other persuasions. Now, I'm just saying this as an instruction, particularly to those who are part of our churches. I pray to God that we never have an attitude with any of the things that God has shown us and any of the restored truths that we have the privilege to live in, in such a way that others would feel judged or condemned because they haven't necessarily seen those things in the same ways. And so, so really what we're saying is, as passionately as I'm teaching this in this session, I would pray that the outworking of that would be gracious and warm and encouraging other people to consider the scriptures regarding these matters rather than a, a kind of like, you're not like us judgment. That's, that's absolutely not in our hearts. So, okay, and five, the spirit of the age. Beyond these seemingly rational reasons for not practicing head covering, we would be naive to think that we are not affected by the worldly culture in which we have been raised. Sometimes this effect is subtle, but can produce surprisingly vehement feelings and irrational thoughts, even among those who are typically balanced and biblical in their approach. Boy, I, you know, when I remember when I first taught this, a particular lady coming up at the end of the teaching, and um, uh, had great affection for this particular lady. She's been in the church for many years, really outstanding in many ways, just a, a great mom, you know, a great serving lady in the church, just a very prophetically gifted. And, um, and she came up and she approached me. She had kind of a smile on her face. And I thought, oh, she's just coming to encourage me. And, and she, um, she kind of shook my hand and she said, well, you know, John, that was that was really great. I I really appreciate how uh, diligently you've unpacked this, and um, really appreciate you taking the time to teach this. But as I was uh, uh, just sat there listening, um, I just want to say to you, I am really angry. And it was quite shocking, to be honest with you. I was expecting something very pleasant, and it was a, it was a very shocking reaction. And, and, and you know, bless her, it, what was happening was something was being stirred in her that she just hadn't anticipated. And I think what was happening is as I was touching these truths, it was pressing buttons of uh, her history, and maybe it was cutting across the spirit of feminism, which was the world that she and most of us have been brought up in, and it was causing something of a, a strength, a vehemence of reaction that was shocking to her as well. Now, 
Um, it's been wonderful over the years to see her so thoroughly work through all of those things. And um, But I, I just want to say to you, it might be that even as you're listening to the things that I'm saying, that something inside of you is reacting. Now, I just want to say to you, don't, don't dismiss that as insignificant. It really is significant. And I find as we address these truths, it can often challenge a blindness that is determined to remain blind. Do you understand what I mean by that? You know, they say that uh, no blindness is like that of the man who will not see. You know, if you get to that place where you will not see, then you're very unlikely to come into the vision that God wants to give you. You know, there's another saying um, that goes like this, a man persuaded against his will is of the same opinion still. A man persuaded against his will. You know, there's been times over the years where I've had discussions with people about truths that I'm teaching, and by the end of the discussion or the teaching, they are like, okay, I accept what you're saying, but you know it's with a kind of reluctance of heart. There's like a grudging, accept. it's like I don't want to believe this, but you've just, you've out-argued me but you've not changed my will. And sure enough, next time you see that person, they've got two or three more arguments, you know? It's like they've retreated, they've regrouped, and they come out with more. And I'm like, I don't mind, you know, I don't mind that discussion backwards and forwards, but I know that very often for people to come into revelation, there's got to be that, God, your will be done. Your will be done. I want what you want over what I want. And I'm telling you something, guys. You'll know when you've got to that place because you'll start to receive things with joy. What I find is when the will has shifted, then comes the joy of revelation. It's like the more you're seeing, the more you're excited because you're like, now I, wow, I thought I got it before, but now I've really got it. And you see him again, and now I've really got it. And it's like, yeah, that's what happened. Joy has come because the will has been shifted. Now, I want to ask you this question as we get into this subject. Are you open in your heart? Are you open in your heart? Has your will been adjusted to say, God, I want to see what you're saying here. And if it cuts across my feelings, my inclination, then let my feelings change. Let my inclination be shifted because I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, most of our feelings and inclinations are simply shaped by our culture. Our culture has had its effect on us so that sometimes when we hear truth, there's not an immediate resonating in our heart. There can be that, oh, that doesn't sound right. Oh, that can't be right. You know? See, sometimes you teach on subjects like what the Bible teaches about hell. Very unpopular in our culture. Oh, well, that doesn't sound right. That doesn't sound like my God. Well, you don't serve the God of your imagination. And you don't serve the God of your culture. If you're born again, you serve the God of the Bible. And that's what I'm asking you to think about as we jump into what we're going to look at in this session. Okay, hermeneutics. What a strange term. Before we systematically work through the text, we need to explain the principles that we will be employing as we attempt to correctly understand its meaning. These principles are what theologians call hermeneutics, which is the science of understanding translating and interpreting scripture. It is a way of outworking Paul's exhortation to Timothy to be a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. So you'll, you'll quite often hear people say, oh, it's, it's just a matter of interpretation, as if that in itself is the end of the discussion, <laughs> you know? Listen, when people say that, I say, yes, absolutely, you're right, okay, Let's start looking at our rules for interpretation then. I agree with you. I agree that you have an interpretation, I have an interpretation. So let's start by looking at what are the rules that you use for interpretation? Because how many of you know you can play the same game, but if you're playing with different rules, it doesn't work? You know, like, I, listen, I grew up with four older brothers and we used to play board games all the time. And one of the things that I discovered was my brothers were often functioning with different rules. 
than I was, which is why they would always win. And there's times where I'd say, hey, how come you did this? Well, it says this in the rules. Yeah, I didn't know anything to challenge it, but those rules seem to change a lot, you know? And, and I find that this can happen with theology as well. If people aren't actually being faithful to the same principles, you're not gonna get a consistent conclusion, okay? So what I'm saying is this, there are rules, um, which is what hermeneutics are. They're rules for interpretation. And I just wanna say, by the way, these are not our rules, okay? This is not one church ministry's rules or living light rules. These are rules that have been accepted by theologians over the centuries when it comes to rightly handling the word of God. So, so let's get into them. The first hermeneutical principle is that we are to interpret literally what is said. The term literal comes from the Latin litera, meaning letter. To interpret the Bible literally is to understand it according to the letters and words used. It might seem very obvious that, but it is quite remarkable sometimes when you talk to people about what the Bible says because they immediately kick into this, well, what does it mean to you? As if there is no actual meaning in the letters and the words. <laughs> You know, it's like when the Bible says, thou shalt not steal. Well, what does that mean to you? <laughs> well, to me, it means that God loves me. <laughs> I think, listen, there's plenty of Bible to confirm what you've just said, but not that verse. That verse means you don't take stuff that's not yours, okay? <laughs> Let's just concentrate on what the words actually say. <laughs> All right. Although the Bible is the inspired word of God, each passage should be interpreted according to the type of literature that is used. Scripture can be in the form of historical narrative, poetry, metaphors, prophetic imagery, parables, practical instruction, authoritative command, etc. Depending on what and how God's word is communicating, different responses are required. For example, the required response to a poetic text might be nothing more than joy and inspiration, whereas the required response to an authoritative command is clearly one of obedience. Okay, so what are we saying here? Guys, we're saying that the Bible is constructed, the writing of scripture is in different styles. And it is legitimate for us to consider the style of writing when we're looking at how to interpret what's being said. Sometimes it is this kind of um, historical narrative. It's just a story that we're reading to understand what happened. Sometimes it's poetry. You know, you've got the poetry of Song of Solomon where things are written like, you know, her teeth are like the, a flock of sheep just shorn. Now, I don't know what that does for you, but... You know, it gives us an image. It's not literally saying her teeth are random sheep, you know, just having been sure. No, it's, it's a picture of the brightness and the whiteness of what he's trying to communicate. Or you get scriptures that say the eyes of the Lord roam throughout the earth. Now, literally, it's not like these enormous eyeballs are flying along. It's not like the eye of Sauron, you know. So, no, it's, it's a picture it's a, it's, it's a poetic communication or a prophetic communication of God seeing everything and searching. That's, that, that's what's being communicated. And yet there are other scriptures which are so clearly authoritative command that they leave us with no room for our own personal interpretation of them. They are just clearly stating what God is saying must be done. If a passage of scripture is written in a clear, straightforward way, then we are simply to receive it in that way. We do not have the liberty to seek for a hidden meaning beyond the obvious and apparent unless there is a clear historical or linguistic reason to do so. Okay, you're following what we're saying here. We're saying if something is clear and straightforward, that first principle should kick into place and we should receive it literally. Okay, another hermeneutical principle uh, 
we referenced in the previous session, and one we will return to later in this session, is the harmonization of Scripture. This is when we consider a passage in the light of the rest of Scripture in order to find God's full counsel and thereby obtain greater clarity. So if you recall, last session, we looked at the Scripture that referred to women being silent in the churches but with the harmonization of other scriptures that clearly gave us illustration of women being vocal in the meeting of the churches, it allowed us a fresh light to consider a deeper meaning to what was obvious at first reading. Is this making sense? If something is obvious at first reading and there's no reason to look elsewhere, there's no other scriptures shedding other light on it, then we have to be faithful to what it says. Agreed? All right, so instructions when praying and prophesying. In the light of these principles, let us approach this passage of Scripture with an open heart and mind. We will start by reading from the New International Version, then go verse by verse, considering its literal meaning. This will include looking at a number of the original Greek words and will help bring clarity and dispel some common misunderstandings. Okay, so before I actually read this passage, I, I want to ask you to do something which I know is it's virtually impossible, but I'm going to ask you to try anyway. I want you to try and hear what I'm about to read as though this was a letter from the Apostle Paul to you bringing an instruction. I want you to listen to it as though you've never heard this before. I want you to listen to it without prejudice, prejudgment. I want you to put aside all that you have previously understood and concluded about this subject and just hear it like you would a letter from a friend bringing some direction to you. Now, I'll explain in a moment why I'm doing that, but I just, just want you to hear it in that way. So 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 2 to 16 read like this. I praise you for remembering me in everything and for holding to the teachings just as I pass them on to you. Now I want you to realize that the head of every man is Christ and the head of the woman is man and the head of Christ is God. Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head and every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. It is just as though her head were shaved. If a woman does not cover her head, she should have her hair cut off. And if it's a disgrace for a woman to have her hair cut or shaved off, she should cover her head. A man ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God. But the woman is the glory of man. For man did not come from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. For this reason, and because of the angels, the woman ought to have a sign of authority on her head. In the Lord, however, woman is not independent of man, nor is man independent of woman. For as woman came from man, so also man is born of woman. But everything comes from God. Judge for yourselves. Is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not the very nature of things teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a disgrace to him, but that if a woman has long hair, it is her glory, for long hair is given to her as a covering? If anyone wants to be contentious about this, we have no other practice, nor do the churches of God. You know, um, I was talking to a friend of mine some years ago who was speaking at a major Christian conference, one of the biggest Christian youth conferences in England. And um, a particular teacher uh, referenced this scripture, actually read it out, and it wasn't even the main text that he was going to speak from. It was just a passage that he was going to connect into what he wanted to say. And at the end of reading out the passage that I just read, the crowd booed. The crowd actually booed the reading of Scripture. I find that alarming 
to such a degree that it caused me when he told me to really question what have we done as Christian leaders that our young people will actually boo the word of God. Now, in my mind, I don't know whether they were booing because they just were so unfamiliar with it that they didn't know it was the Bible. I trust that is the case rather than them knowing it was the Bible and just booing it anyway. Now, I only wanted to mention this, guys, because I just want you to understand just how remote these truths have become to the forthcoming generation. Now, that aside, I want to ask you a question, the question I asked at the beginning of reading this passage. If I was to say to you, what did Paul say? What would your answer be? Is there anything that you clearly heard out of what I read? Anything? Sign of authority. Okay, so Jordan heard a sign of authority that this this thing, this head covering is a sign of authority. Yep, anything else? She doesn't cover her head. She should have her hair cut off. Okay, Linda heard that she should have her hair cut off if she doesn't cover her head. Wow, yep. Yeah. Head of every man is Christ. The head of every man is Christ. Yep, absolutely. Anything else? Because of the angels. Right, okay. So there's this issue of angelic observation that comes through here. Anything else? A man should not have his head covered. Right, okay, that a man should not have his head covered. Specifically, I would say, within this context of praying and prophesying, that a man should not have his head covered, yeah? Anything else? Uh, long hair is the glory of a woman. Yep, that long hair is the glory of a woman. All right, that's, that's helpful, that's good. Now, listen, I want to say something here um, about the simplicity of your conclusions, because... Honestly, sometimes people have felt almost embarrassed to actually say what appears to be obvious here. Sometimes it's because they feel like there must be something deeper that we're missing. Um, but I want you to understand that in actual fact, your conclusions, much of what you just shared at that point, would be consistent with what Christians throughout the centuries have concluded. So don't feel in any way embarrassed at the simplicity of your observations. I think as we go through this, you're going to realize that your observations are actually 100% correct. So applying hermeneutical principles to the passage. In accordance with the first hermeneutical principle, we should start by asking ourselves, does Paul appear to be giving any straightforward instruction in this passage? And if so, what is that? Most would agree, at the very least, Paul is saying that men should not pray or prophesy with their heads covered, and that women should cover their heads when praying or prophesying. Some might feel a little embarrassed to admit to having arrived at such a simple conclusion. The fact is that this conclusion is consistent with the overwhelming majority of great Christian thinkers for the last 2,000 years of church history. Many of the great leaders of the church, such as Irenaeus, Clement of Alexandria, Tertullian of Carthage, Hippolytus, John Chrysostom, Jerome, Augustine, John Knox, John Calvin, and John Wesley made strong defenses of the practice in their generation. However, it's not our intention to teach from church history but from the scripture itself. Now, guys, I believe that we could strongly teach from church history why these conclusions are clear and accurate. Um, and again, there's not this sort of sense of, oh, there must be something deeper here, you know. And, and I understand how we can feel that way. Sometimes when something seems so simple, we can think, well, oh, there, there must be something else. You know, I think back to that time when, when the, the disciples came back to Jesus at the well and they're, and they're talking to him and he makes this statement, I have food that you know nothing of. And they're like, you know, did somebody bring him a sandwich and we didn't know about it, you know? And, and I feel that we can also have that sense of Jesus must be speaking or the scripture must be speaking of some deep hidden thing that we don't understand. But I want to encourage you that, again, the first hermeneutical principle is that we read things literally as they're being said. And that is the way it would have been understood throughout history. 
Despite this passage clearly being straightforward instruction, it is one of the few scriptures where people, for no immediately obvious reason, will reach for a hidden meaning. This New Testament passage is undeniably written as direct apostolic command and is nestled between two instructive passages relating to the Lord's Supper, neither of which is contested as anything but enduring instruction for church practice. Okay, so earlier I said that you've got to look at the style of writing uh, that you're interpreting. You remember, we looked at the different styles. This is clear apostolic direction. This is not poetic. This is not narrative. This is not even prophetic in that sense. It is straightforward instruction. And like we say here, it's placed between scriptures that nobody questions. Mm -hmm. Scriptures on the Lord's Supper that are quoted in church after church, Sunday after Sunday, without any question. And yet this little passage of scripture is omitted from most church life when it clearly lies within that same category. And I, guys, I just want to say this should cause a sort of suspicion to arise in us. Mm -hmm. Does it not make you ask the question, why? Mm -hmm. Why is it that people would reach for a hidden meaning? Why, why is it that people would ignore such a text? Furthermore, the principle of harmonization of scripture does not alter the conclusion as there is no other text of scripture that addresses the subject directly. Okay, you following what I'm saying here? We don't have the liberty to look to other texts on head covering and uncovering. Why? Because there isn't any. There are no other texts for us to actually look at and say, well, let's shed some more light on this on the basis of these other scriptures. There are. This is it. Therefore... We are left with a question. Is this one clear apostolic command enough to require of us obedience? That's a real question. Is it? Is it enough that God should say it one time and therefore require us to be obedient? You know, I have uh, four children and... Uh, if any of my children didn't do what they were told to do on the basis that I'd only told them once, they would be significantly disciplined. If my kids said, what? Yeah, I didn't tidy the room. I said, well, why didn't you tidy your room? Because you only said it once. You see, I'm just an earthly father and I expect obedience to a direction I bring to my children. How much more God? How much more the God of the heavens do you think requires obedience when he says something one time? Now, I believe this is a really important issue because it's that type of dismissal that people will have. Well, it's only one passage of scripture. <clears throat> Somehow, if God had really meant it, he'd have said it repeatedly. I think this is a real error. Mm -hmm. I think this is a real mistake that people are making in terms of their dismissal of these things. And so embracing eternal truth, it is our conviction that the appalling treatment of this scripture is primarily due to the fact that it underscores the doctrine of God's creational design for men and women and their distinctive roles as taught in the previous session. This doctrine is largely rejected by the modern Western church. So guys, what we're saying here is this, it's our conviction, our belief that the reason this is dismissed is because of what it underscores. It's the truths that are supported and emphasized through this practice. Because the practice itself is not that big of a deal, is it? I mean, seriously, guys, is it that big of a deal that a woman should put some sort of head covering on her head just when she publicly prays and prophesies? Is it that big of a deal that a guy should take his baseball cap off? I mean, honestly... It's nothing compared with the inconvenience of water baptism. It's nothing compared with the challenge of tithing. It's nothing compared with the, the life demand that belonging to a small group might require. Isn't it relatively small a thing to be so contested? Well, I believe it is a small thing on one level, but I think it's an enormous thing on another level because of what it actually underscores. This is not to say 
that this is only a modern problem. The fact that Paul addresses the issue and brings the instruction that he does is a clear indication that the issue was neither fully understood nor totally accepted, even in his day. You ever heard the argument people say, well, people understood it in those days. That's why it was valid then. Well, let me just ask you this. If they understood it so clearly, why on earth did Paul write all of this out to explain it? They were clearly struggling with it at the time, but did accept his teaching after he brought this direction. How easy it would have been for Paul to have removed any confusion by dismissing this practice. Remember, this is the same apostle who actively dismantled so much Jewish tradition, even something as foundational as circumcision. An important question for us to answer is why did he go to such lengths to lay a doctrinal foundation for a practice that would be irrelevant in future cultures? And perhaps an even more important question would be why would God, in his sovereignty, allow it to be included in the canon of Scripture? As we go through the text, we will draw much from an exegetical study paper which we will provide as an addendum. 1 Corinthians 11, 2 to 16. So let's get into verse by verse. You ready? All right, verse 2. I praise you for remembering me in everything and holding to the teachings just as I pass them on to you. Paul starts by commending them for holding to his teachings or traditions, as other translations say. By this, Paul is emphasizing apostolic tradition, something beyond normal instruction that was to be held to precisely, hence the phrase, just as I pass them on to you. Now, I want to make a point here that what Paul is saying here is that token obedience is not adequate for apostolic tradition. He's saying that, listen, I'm commending you for holding on to these teachings, these traditions, exactly as I pass them on to you, which means that we don't have this liberty to translate it into a way that we feel is more culturally acceptable because that's not practicing them in the way that he passed them on. So some people might sort of like answer this by saying, well, yeah, you know, head covering, uncovering, not really relevant in our culture. So, so we actually outwork this in another way. <laughs> you know, if you were to actually follow that conversation through and say, oh, that's interesting, how do you work it out? You will find that there will be nothing of a visual outworking of this going on. You know, I've heard people say, well, I think it probably would be better for, you know, maybe a woman to wear a badge or a sticker saying I'm submitted when she... Pre I'm like, fine, give that a go. See how that works out for you, you know. Because the truth is, anything that people would feel would be more culturally relevant. If that were true, it would expose the issue of the things that the practice actually draws attention to. And that's really the crux of the issue. People don't want to expose the issues that Paul is really addressing here, which is God's creational order. Okay. Later, in the same letter, Paul makes the following remarkably authoritative statement. If anybody thinks he is a prophet or spiritually gifted, let him acknowledge that what I am writing to you is the Lord's command. If he ignores this, he himself will be ignored. It's strong stuff, isn't it? <laughs> I want you to realize, verse 3, I want you to realize that the head of every man is Christ and the head of the woman is man and the head of Christ is God. Paul launches his teaching with nothing less than the Godhead and starts with the most powerful expression of voluntary submission in Christ. There is no stronger theological foundation Paul could have used than this as the basis of his argument. Okay, so Paul chooses a completely uncontestable start, and he builds it on the submission of Christ himself as God the Son. I want you to understand something here. Paul could not 
have theologically started this in any way stronger than he did. This is not just a, an off-the-cuff argument. This is not just a persuasion. This is not just an idea. Paul is starting with his theological understanding in the most substantial way he can with the Godhead itself. It's, it's amazing. As an alternative to the principle of submission, some in recent years have sought to argue that the word head, which in Greek is kephali, could mean something other than authority over another. The possibility of source, like the head of a river, has been suggested. However, to apply this meaning in this text is dubious. There is a complete lack of evidence, both in scripture and the Greek literature of Paul's day, that the term head means source when used in reference to people. Furthermore, the meaning of authority over another makes the best sense in all other scriptural occurrences of the word. To take one, for example, Ephesians 5.23 says, for the husband is the head of the wife. In what meaningful way is the husband the source of the wife? Guys, this is just an attempt, really, to wriggle out of the clear meaning of what's being said here. And we would encourage people to recognize that in interpreting this word. Verse 4 to 5 says this, Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head, and every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. It is just as though her head were shaved. As we look at what Paul is saying here, it should be noted that throughout this text, the actual type of covering is not defined. What we do know is that Paul does not use the word for the full veiling often associated with Middle Eastern tradition. Furthermore, Paul uses the Greek verb katakalupto, meaning to cover, this word is used somewhat generally in scripture to describe the act of covering with something. Therefore, from what we can ascertain, Paul simply required that women wear some type of head covering when praying or prophesying in the church. Okay, so this, I want to say this just to refute the attitude that sometimes can emerge, which is, well, I guess if we're going to use head covering, we should do it properly and go all the way. And listen, but what we're saying here is that's not actually what Paul was saying. He could have used a word that described head covering in that way. That's not the word he used, which is why we, in our practice of this, are at peace for women actually to wear head covering, which is really what he's saying, something that covers the head, something that actually the best translation is attaches to the hair and in some ways come down. That, that's all that we know. It's a very vague word that Paul uses here. In these verses, Paul uses highly potent language. He describes a dishonor, actually a disgrace taking place. However, the Greek language here conveys much more than its English equivalent. The person spoken of is continually, persistently, willingly, actively, or directly performing an act of public humiliation, shame, disgrace, and embarrassment to his or her head. It is not indicating necessarily that the person in question is intending or even aware of the reality of what is happening. Nevertheless, from Paul's apostolic perspective, a public disgrace is continually occurring either by a man covering his physical head or a woman not covering hers when publicly praying out or prophesying. Do you catch the strength of Paul's language here? I mean, this is not Paul pointing out something that is unseemly, something that is uh, mildly offensive. Paul is describing something that from his apostolic perspective is a total disgrace, a total dishonor. But again, the scripture doesn't indicate here that the woman would have any awareness or the man would have any natural awareness of this. Because I know that people have sometimes said, well, I don't think it can be a big deal because I've not felt any sort of sense of wrongness 
or conviction regarding these things. This is the point we're making here. There's nothing in the scripture that says that there's any deliberate or even awareness taking place in the people that are doing this. But it's Paul saying, I can see something here. I can see something. God has given me sight into the heavenly realms here. And this is what I'm seeing when this is taking place. You know, I find it, honestly, guys, I, I tremble at our willingness, our readiness to dismiss apostolic teaching and disregard it in the way that we do. It, it, it's, it's shocking that so much Christian culture is just ready to walk away from the language of what Paul is saying here. This brings us back to the teaching on apostles in session 12. One of the key gifts of the apostolic ministry is the ability to see into the heavenly realm. For example, Paul spoke of insight into mysteries hidden from previous generations, but now revealed to apostles and prophets in Ephesians 3 verses 4 to 5. He spoke of being caught up to the third heaven and hearing inexpressible things, things that man is not permitted to tell. He referenced a thorn in the flesh given to him to prevent him from becoming conceited because of the surpassingly great revelations he received in 2 Corinthians 12. Is it not then reasonable for us to believe that the Apostle Paul was seeing something that we may not yet recognize. Doesn't humility itself cause us to recognize that just because we don't see something doesn't mean that there's nothing to be seen? Surely something should happen in our hearts to recognize that, hey, could it be that the Apostle Paul, who explains his vision and gifting in God being so revelatory is capturing something that we just don't actually recognize. But why should the covering of a man's head when praying or prophesying be disgraceful? And why should the opposite be disgraceful for a woman? Perhaps the answer lies in God's requirement that men and women appear clearly distinct from one another and in doing so display acknowledgement of his creational order. Verse 6. If a woman does not cover her head, she should have her hair cut off. And if it's a disgrace for a woman to have her hair cut or shaved off, she should cover her head. This is quite an extraordinary verse to me, by the way, because I don't think that Paul was sort of saying this in jest, you know, and I think in that very radical New Testament early church, I think there would be people that would be reading this in the, okay, well, if she won't cover her head, she needs to get her hair shaved off. Um, I'm not advocating that we reintroduce this ministry to the church, by the way. I'm just saying, seriously, this is something that Paul was speaking of in such strong language. Paul assumes certain things here, like the disgrace and shame associated with a woman having her hair shaved off. Up until very recently, and still to some extent today, the shaving of a woman's head has always been a sign of humiliation. Paul knows that the Corinthians would have understood this. Some have speculated that a shaved head was a sign of prostitution in Corinth, but this is highly doubtful. It is much more likely that Paul is addressing the loss of perhaps the clearest expression of a woman's femininity, that being her hair length. Okay, so what we're saying here is Paul is appealing to something that the Corinthians would have understood, that a woman with her hair shaved off would be in a humbled state. Now, I know that we live in a culture where length of hair doesn't have the same impact on masculinity and femininity as it would have had in those days. But honestly, we need to understand that that is very much more a modern way of thinking. I don't know about you, but if you ever see those, um, the footage of the concentration camps during the Holocaust and I think one of the things that is just most uh, 
horrific and heart-rendering is just seeing women with their heads shaved being moved around the camps. And that sense of humiliation, that sense of disgrace that can so often go along with that. You know, you see this also when people have to undergo chemotherapy and the loss of hair. You know, for guys, the loss of hair, you know, bummer. For most of them, it's just not really an issue. But, you know, it can be often for a lady that one of the worst things that they have to go through is the loss of their hair. Now, guys, what we're saying is these truths of masculinity and femininity and our differences are inherent to us. And uh, we see it in all sorts of ways. And I believe that Paul is appealing to this in what he's saying. When he says, doesn't even the very nature of things, when he speaks in an assumptive way, it's because that's how people would have thought in that time regarding the issue of hair and hair length. And so verses uh, seven to nine say, a man ought not to cover his head since he is the image and the glory of God, but the woman is the glory of man. For man did not come from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. Paul here uses the term glory, which conveys the idea of honor. And he is again arguing the truths of creation. Notice this has nothing to do with the culture of the day and nothing to do with the fall. It is original intention, not fallen condition, that Paul is referencing. When we lead out in prayer or prophecy, we engage in a most amazing privilege, that of acting as the very mouthpiece of the church to God or of God to the church. It appears to matter to God that at this time, of functioning with such authority, we do something to outwardly acknowledge him and our submission to his authority as our creator. What I'm saying here, guys, is that this is not about what matters to us. This really isn't about our preferences. This is about what matters to him. This is not about how we feel. It's about how God feels about this whole issue. I want to say that when we prophesy, we actually, in that moment of time, are acting as God speaking to his bride. And when we pray out in a way that is leading the church, we are acting as the mouthpiece of the church to God. What an incredible privilege. What a what a, a, a frightening assumption some might feel to actually be in that position. Is it really too much for God to ask that at that point where we function in that way, that we do something to acknowledge submission and his order in our lives? For a man, that submission is the removing of anything from his head. For a woman, it's the putting of something on her head. I want to ask you again, is it really too much that God would ask us to do this? I know for some people, there is a wrestle at this point, which is, well, what should I do if I'm not totally convinced? I think he might be saying that, but maybe he's not saying that. You know, while we're on this subject, I came across something that the late R.C. Sproul wrote regarding this very subject. He said this, he said, what if after careful consideration of a biblical mandate, we remain uncertain as to its character as principle or custom? If we must decide to treat it one way or the other, but have no conclusive means to make the decision, what can we do? Here, the biblical principle of humility can be helpful. The issue is simple. Would it be better to treat a possible custom as a principle and be guilty of being over-scrupulous in our design to obey God? Or would it be better to treat a possible principle as a custom and be guilty of being unscrupulous in demoting a transcendent requirement of God to the level of a mere human convention? I hope the answer is obvious. You'd think the answer would be obvious, 
But I've talked to many, many people over the years that have found themselves in just that place of, I'm not sure if it's the command of God or whether it's just a convention of the time. But because of that, they've chosen to dismiss it rather than choosing the humility to say, hey, I'd rather, if I go one way, be over-scrupulous than be dismissive. Yeah. Verse 10 says this, For this reason, and because of the angels, the woman ought to have a sign of authority on her head. We should note three things in this statement. First of all, for this reason and because of the angels. Beyond Paul's previous reason for the practice, the dishonor demonstrated by lack of acknowledgement of creational order, he now introduces a further reason, angelic observation of this fact. Because Paul does not elaborate on this point, it has been easy for many to dismiss it. Again, it stands in complete contradiction to the cultural argument. What have angels to do with trends in Corinth? Angels are mysterious creatures, and although Scripture does not give us a lot of insight into the angelic realm, it is nevertheless apparent that a major part of God's agenda is fulfilled in the church's demonstration to the heavens. And we come back to this scripture in Ephesians 3.10, which says his intent was that now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. So it's clear here that a big part of God's agenda is demonstrating to the heavens something through the church. This is one of those demonstrations, we believe. What we do know about angels should give us an insight into why our example of responsive obedience is important to them. In scripture, angels operate under divine command. These incredibly powerful creatures, in Isaiah 37, 36, one angel destroyed 185,000 people. These incredibly powerful creatures function as messengers and ministering spirits on God's behalf. It appears that an astounding third of the angels in heaven were deceived by Satan when he disregarded his own place in creation and rejected God's authority. It is also clear that angels and their fallen counterparts, demons, are unable to see into the hearts of men. However, angels are observers of outward signs, as was most dramatically seen in the Passover. This is when the enslaved Israelites were instructed to put ram's blood on the doorpost of their houses. When the destroyer that we read of in Hebrews 11:28, who many have understood as the angel of death, passed over God's people, he saw the blood and spared the firstborn. Okay, so let me just say a few things about angels. Doesn't it astound you that a third of the angels fell with Satan? I'm often baffled by that. How could you have been in the heavens seeing God and actually fall for Satan? It tells me something about how impressive the devil must have been. But it also raises the question of, I don't know how perceptive angels are, to be honest with you. You know, we assume that angels are brilliant creatures in terms of their understanding. I don't know that. The scripture doesn't speak much about that. And I'm not saying this to be attacking or dismissive or mocking angels in any way. But what I do know is that many of them fell and they fell over issues of submission and authority. They fell because they followed a leadership that was usurping authority and non-submissive. Listen, when I think about this whole issue of the destroyer moving across the people of Israel, I think to myself, it is amazing that people would say things like, well, God sees my heart. Hey, I just want to say, this is not about God seeing your, of course God sees your heart. Of course God knows your heart. I have no one say, I don't have to put something on my head for God to know that I'm submissive. I'm not denying that. I'm not questioning that. But this is not about what God sees. This is about angelic observation. 
This is an instruction that connects to angels. How tragic it would have been for any who failed to be obedient that night, trusting instead in the idea of God knowing their heart. We are given very little direction regarding our interaction with angels. What a shame it is that we ignore this one clear directive we are given for their benefit, and we being people who will one day judge them. Do you understand this, don't you, brothers and sisters? The Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians, do you not know that one day you'll judge angels? Perhaps our disregard of them in this matter may be a contributing factor as to why our interaction with them seems so infrequent compared to that of the early church. Number two, there's this word ought. The word ought is used several times in this passage. It has lost some of its strength in modern usage, and some mistakenly take it to imply an option or choice. However, this word means to owe, to be bound by debt or be morally obligated. To take these meanings and apply them to the text would cause it to read, on account of the previously stated reasons, the woman therefore is bound by a sense of debt and moral obligation to have authority upon the head. Choice is not in view. The fall is not in view. Culture is not in view. However, moral obligation to the created order of God is in view. The third point from this section is sign of authority. Despite the fact that most translations use the term sign or symbol of authority, it is interesting to note that the Greek text is more accurately translated, the woman is morally obligated to have authority upon the head on account of the angels. The term translated authority here can also mean right, liberty, ability, or capability. The text says nothing about a symbol or sign, which Paul very simply could have stated by using the appropriate Greek word for this. Thus, the head covering carries another significance beyond voluntary submission to male headship. Okay, so what I'm saying here is rather than this head covering being some sort of mark or symbol which is demeaning in nature. In actual fact, the, the structure of the scripture is actually placing authority on the head. It's actually something that is liberating and empowering if understood properly. And you know, our experience in the church has been anything but some type of crushing subservience that comes from a woman practicing head covering, many have expressed an increase of a sense of authority, clarity, and right to communicate either for God to the church or for the church to God. And so it is the possession of her liberty, right, and indeed authority to pray and prophesy in the public gatherings to act as the very mouthpiece of the church or even of God. So verses 11 and 12 say, In the Lord, however, woman is not independent of man, nor is man independent of woman. For as woman came from man, so also man is born of woman. But everything comes from God. Recognizing the potential for a polarization between men and women if they do not handle rightly what he is saying, Paul now re-emphasizes our equality of worth and interdependence. You know, actually in this practice that we've been given, it's our opportunity to emphasize our rejection of the battle of the sexes that we spoke of in the previous session. In doing this, we're saying, hey, before God, we are voluntarily responding to his direction and embracing his creational order. You know, when, when a guy uncovers his head when he prays or prophesies, what he's saying is, I'm embracing God's creational order over my life. When a woman covers her head, she's saying, I am embracing God's creational order in my life. No longer is there this contest between the man and the woman. No longer is there this bitterness between the man and the woman. No longer is there this dominant control and this 
fighting against, that the battle of the sexes are reduced to nothing as we embrace God's creational order. Verse 13 says, Judge for yourselves, is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? It has been suggested by some that when Paul uses the phrase, judge for yourselves, he is in some way relenting. And he is now saying that it is up to the individuals to assess for themselves whether or not to be faithful to this apostolic directive. This is an absurd argument and would not be put forward by any serious theologian. Paul is employing a style of rhetoric to say, in the light of all I have systematically laid out. What does he mean by that? He's saying, in the light of the fact that all of this is rooted in the Godhead. In the light of the fact that if it's rejected, it's a public humiliation to man. In the light of the fact that it's a shame for the woman to remain uncovered with praying and prophesying. The fact that an uncovered woman should be shaved. The fact that woman originates from man. The fact that woman was created to help man. The truth of angelic observation. The right to be the mouthpiece of God and the church. And that God is the originator of all of this. Make a right judgment. That's what Paul's communicating in this. And so verses 14 to 15a, does not the very nature of things teach you that if a man has long hair, it's a disgrace to him, but that if a woman has long hair, it is her glory. The first thing we should point out is that these verses referencing hair length for men and women are not Paul's central argument and that there is no apostolic command or specific definition stated here regarding what is long and short. Paul is making a natural observation as a supporting argument to his main objective of establishing the practices we have discussed thus far. You understanding what we're saying here, folks? What we're saying is that Paul's central argument is nothing to do with hair length for men and women. He's just drawing in an understanding that would have been relevant. And this is where we would concede that there is a cultural, natural connection to this, which is not so much the case for us because we don't associate masculinity with hair length anything like to the same degree that they would have in a culture where everybody wore robes. So in a culture where everybody was wearing loose robes, the clearest evidence of being masculine or feminine would have been the length of your hair. So we're acknowledging that that is the case and that's not so much the case for us. But it was only a support argument for his main argument in any case. He is developing the point he introduced earlier in verse 6, that of the importance of clear distinction between men and women and the disgrace when this is blurred. Has there ever been a time in history where the distinction of men and women is as blurred as it is in our day? And again, we're naive to think that part of the rejection of what we're talking about here is also connected to a culture that is driving forward an agenda of blurring sexual distinction all the time. Here we acknowledge that Paul's statement is more difficult to understand in a culture where the length of hair does not define manhood and womanhood to the same degree that it once did. However, At the very least, it is clear to us that Paul would consider it to be a disgrace for a man to appear in such a way that he could be mistaken for a woman and vice versa. So how does this apply in the life of the church? Well, brothers and sisters, it does. And one of the things that we would say is we celebrate masculinity in the church and we celebrate femininity. And what that means in real terms is when Uh, A young man comes to the church, if that person would be indistinguishable from a woman, we would lovingly be counseling him and helping him grow in masculinity and vice versa. If a woman comes to the church and one can't define femininity, we would be looking for her to get to grips with those things. Verse 15b says this, "'For long hair is given to her as a covering.'" By this, Paul is drawing an illustration from the natural realm to help us visualize the spiritual reality. 
However, some have wondered whether Paul is saying that if a woman has long hair, that is her head covering. Closer examination of the structure of Paul's argument proves this to be a completely illogical conclusion. If Paul's main argument was the importance of women having long hair, why wouldn't he have started by stating this and only applied head covering to those who had shaved heads? However, the clearest verse to refute this conclusion would be verse 6, which says, If a woman does not cover her head, she should have her hair cut off. See how illogical it would be to substitute long hair for a head covering in this verse. It would read, If a woman does not have long hair, she should have her hair cut off. You get the point we're making here, guys. If long hair was an adequate substitute for head covering, why should it be cut off if a woman does not use head covering? It's just completely illogical as an argument to actually think that Paul is now just saying, yeah, but if a woman has long hair, that is a head covering. And I've heard people say that, and often I've challenged them with, okay, well, if that is what you believe then, do you teach that? Do all the women in your church have long hair then? And again, you find, well, well you know, th th there's a kind of a crumbling of the argument at that point, because really the whole issue is to get away from the instruction, not to find a practice that's faithful to it. Verse 16, if anyone wants to be contentious about this, we have no other practice, nor do the churches of God. You'd think that with such a straightforward closing argument that that would be the end of the debate, wouldn't you? The reality is, even within this, we've seen how the enemy has twisted the concept of this to communicate something different. Let's get back to the notes. Some have suggested that Paul is saying, if anyone has a problem with this teaching, we don't practice it ourselves and neither do any of the other churches. So ignore all that I've just said. However, Paul's intention in his closing statement is the opposite of this. He meant it to close down any contention by pointing out that this was not merely a Corinthian issue, nor unique to his apostolic sphere, but was accepted apostolic practice for the entire church. So, practicing this doctrine. In our examination of 1 Corinthians 11, 2 to 16, we believe the directives that Paul gives supersede issues of time and culture and are aspects of the wisdom of God we as the church are to display. Therefore, we ask that when leading out in prayer, that is in such a way as commands the attention of others, or prophesying in public or church gatherings, men remove any head covering and that women wear some type of head covering. With the implementation of the practice of this doctrine, we have faced some challenges. However, we have also enjoyed great blessings. These have included the following. The peace and joy of having faced a challenging passage of scripture in a way that is faithful to sound hermeneutical principles and having established a practice consistent with our conclusions. Two, greater revelation of the wonder of godly submission. Three, a deeper honor and respect between men and women. Four, an increasing sense of authority among women in the realm of prayer and prophecy in the church. Five, tremendous opportunities to engage with others in explaining the principles of adherence to scripture and sharing insights into God's order in creation. Six, many opportunities to bring healing to those who have been injured by previous abuses of authority. And seven, constant and victorious confrontation with the spirit of the age. This ends this particular session and ends our course in general. Just want to thank you, uh, all of you who have invested time to listen to what we've communicated over these 20 sessions. We pray that these things will become true foundations for your lives. God bless you. Thanks again for joining me in these 20 foundational teachings. My hope and prayer is that you will know the blessing of being doers of the word, not merely hearers.
I'd love to hear feedback from you regarding the course in general or any of the specific sessions and you can do that by emailing me directly at jlalji at onechurchministries.com. If you'd like to know more about One Church Ministries, please visit our One Church Ministries website. Finally, it has been our desire to make these teachings as accessible as possible around the world and we've not wanted to bring a limitation to this by charging. However, if this course has been a blessing to you and you'd like to sow into the mission of One Church Ministries in helping equip and serve the body of Christ, you can do that by finding the link on our website. Your gifts are greatly appreciated. Thank you so much for standing with us in this ministry. May God bless you abundantly.